Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I am Ben Reynolds, host and organizer of the Vent webinar series. Thank you for joining today's presentation. We are delighted to offer this educational presentation about Ecuador. We hope you enjoy today's topic on the best of Amazonia with Paul Greenfield and special guest Brian Gibbons. I would like to turn your attention to the handout section in the control bar where you can find and download the two detailed itinerary of Paul and Brian's upcoming Ecuador tours. During this session, all attendees may ask questions, but please note that we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. However, if you have any technical questions during the session, I'll try my best to answer them in real time. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on demand anytime at your convenience on the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours YouTube channel. And a link to that will be delivered to you in an email tomorrow. Now back to our feature presentation. Paul Greenfield grew up near New York City and became interested in birds as a child. He received his BFA from Temple University, where he majored in fine arts at Tyler School of Art. Since 1972, he has lived in Ecuador, where his fascination for birds and art has culminated with the completion of 20 years of work illustrating The Birds of Ecuador, which he co-authored with Robert Ridgely. The Spanish version was published in 2006, and The Birds of Ecuador app was launched in 2018. Paul is also co-author of Ver Birds of Western Ecuador, a photographic guide. He has participated in the discovery of a number of new avian species to science, and has painted several front piece illustrations of these newly described taxa. He worked as scientific advisor on several independent and BBC nature films, Flight of the Condor, Life on Earth, and Hummingbirds, Jeweled Messengers, with David Attenborough, among others. Paul is very involved in saving Ecuador's avian diversity and important habitats through his involvement with various foundations, as well as working with and inspiring local governments and communities to get involved in the protection of their biodiversity as a pioneer and promoter of birding tourism throughout Ecuador. He has been showing visitors the birds of this fascinating country for nearly five decades and has led many Ecuador bird tours. He and his wife, Marfa, live in Quito. Brian Gibbons grew up in the suburban Dallas where he began exploring the wild world in local creeks and parks, chasing butterflies and any animal that was unfortunate enough to cross the paths with the Gibbons boys occupied his childhood. A wooden bird feeder kit sparked the flame that was stoked by a gift of the Golden Guide and family camping trips to Texas state parks. 30 years ago, Brian attended two vent camps for young birders. Birds are now his primary interest, but all things wild continue to captivate him. After college, Brian undertook a variety of field biology research jobs that have taken him to the Caribbean, the Bering Sea, and the land of the midnight sun, Arctic Alaska. He enjoys working with kids, hoping to spark environmental awareness through birds. For many years, Brian's field research has involved bird banding. His most amazing recoveries were a female Wilson's warbler that had been banded in Alaska and was captured by Brian in Colorado, and a sooty tern that perished after a hurricane on the Texas coast. It had plied the Gulf of Mexico and the oceans of the world for 24 years. Brian's recreational bird seeking has taken him to Machu Picchu in Peru, the Great Wall in China, the plains in East Africa, and the Himalayas in Nepal. Brian leads birding trips in the United States, Central America, the Caribbean, South Africa, and Europe. As well as being a fanatical birder, he loves capturing birds with photography. He lives in Tucson, Arizona with his wife, Lucretia Johnson, and their son, Grayson. We are thrilled to have you both join us today, gentlemen. And to the audience, we hope you enjoy the webinar. Without further ado, we will turn to Paul's presentation.
Thank you, Ben, and welcome to all. I'm glad you could join in and hope to see you soon in the wilds of Ecuador, I hope. Our best of Amazonia adventure promises to be truly awe-inspiring and unforgettable, and a full-on immersion into the wonders of Amazonia set in one of the most, and if not the most, biodiverse locations on Earth. This is a special trip for me, having taken part together with another longtime associate of VENT, uh, Dr. Peter English, in the design and creation of Napa Wildlife Center, which is owned and impressively managed by the small indigenous community of Anyangu. This trip um, is followed by uh, the Eastern Slope of the Andes tour, which is just another way to see more of what's going on uh, from the top of the Andes all the way down into Amazonia, where we will have been uh, finished from with this um, Best of Amazonia tour. And so I join, I think, you know, consider the two of them because they are pretty wonderful together. This is the area that we'll be basically working on. It's a small, a small area. We'll be, you know, leaving from Quito and then going into the Amazon basin, flying uh, into the the little town of Coca, but we'll look at that a little bit more carefully now. If for those of you who have not ever been to Ecuador, don't know much about Ecuador, that bright green smudge down here is uh, is Ecuador, and this little tiny dot over here is the Galapagos Archipelago. And a little close up here on the right of Ecuador's mainland. It's a very small country, as you can see on the on the left map. Um, it's about a less less than a fourth the size of Colombia or Peru, and just far smaller than Brazil. And it's divided basically into three areas, the Pacific Coastal Lowlands, the Andes, which runs down the uh, center of the country, and then the Amazonian uh, basin, um, which we call the El Oriente, the Eastern Zone. We will be flying again from Quito, uh, down to Coca, and then that dark blue area that's along the um, the Napo River, and then eventually we will be going a little bit further in into the forest. Uh, close up view of the area itself. These are some of the places that we will be visiting within the uh, Anyangu area within the Napo Wildlife Center domain, so to speak. We'll be flying into Quito, um, which is in the high Andes, is the capital uh, city of Ecuador, uh, above 9,000 feet. So it's uh, the air is thin. It is the largest, has the largest colonial center in all of the Americas. Um, and for those of you who wish to visit uh, the old town and and uh, Quito proper, I would suggest that you come in a few days earlier. We can make all arrangements if you need them to uh, stay and to uh, visit the area and see all the highlights. We, in our turn, will be um, just staying a couple of minutes, 15 minutes from the airport, which will make it easier for our flight out the next morning uh, to the Amazon. And we'll be staying at Rincón El Puembo, uh, de Puembo, and it is a small um, Smaller, very nice, and it has nice gardens and um, and some interesting birding before we head out. Uh, so we land in Coca, um, which is officially named Francisco de Orellana, the friendly name. The people that, are, that know it well might not even recognize Francisco de Orellana as its official name. Um, and from Coca, we will be traveling down uh, down river, down the Napo River to the Anyangu Cultural Center, where we will be staying first. And then later on, we will be going to Napo Wildlife Center, which is more inland. Um, just sort of another interesting thing about the trip is that we're actually following um, the footsteps, or I don't know if we want to call it the um, the wake of Francisco de Orellana, in, um, who in uh, 1541 left Quito and discovered the uh, mouth of the Coca River. He was coming down actually to find um, 
Gonzalo Pizarro, who was, uh, again, he was a cousin of uh, Francisco Pizarro, uh, famed for murdering Atahualpa, actually. And Gonzalo Pizarro came, uh, did a huge expedition with hundreds of soldiers uh, down the Andes looking for uh, cinnamon and Inca gold, uh, El Dorado. Um, and at one point, uh, about a, close to a month later, he was followed and, and met by Francisco de Orellana, who came with a small group of people, only to find that most of Gonzalo Pizarro's troops had died, uh, either through dysentery and other disease, and they, they say confront confrontation with indigenous warriors, but I tend to doubt that myself. And um, so Orellana was charged with building another boat, building a boat, and following down the, uh, the, the Coca River to find supplies, food, anything they could find and bring it back directly to Pizarro, who was going to return all the way back up the Andes to Quito. Um, but instead, when Francisco's troops, small group, um, made it to the mouth of the Coca River and they found no supplies and no, nothing really that they could, that they could um, bring back, uh, basically, there was a close to a mutiny, and his crew pressured him to continue along the Napo River, um, basically, which is what we do. And so we're following, we're going along that same trajectory. But he eventually continued along there until 1542, where he discovered the Amazon River and explored it all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. So that was the discovery of the Amazon River, basically from Quito down to Coca, and then out. We, in turn, will um, not follow the Andean route that they took. We will fly down to Coca. It's a half an hour flight, and we will be shuttled by bus over to the Napo River, which is 10 minutes, perhaps, um, where we will board a, an ample, really, I would call a huge dugout canoe, thinking that it was made from one tree trunk. Uh, it's very comfortable, comfortable seating, roof, and we will head out from there, depart from Coca. And we will basically be getting, this will be really getting, starting to get away from civilization. Uh, there are some re remnants of modern human activity. Um, the petroleum industry has really taken hold of Ecuador and we will see some remnants of that uh, as we continue eastward. Um, Crisscrossing along the river, this, um, this really rapid flowing, um, Napo River that's heavily silted. We'll be passing small settlements, indigenous Quechua groups, um, and this will be the heat of the day. Basically, somewhere around midday, we'll be having a sort of a bag lunch on aboard the, our, our canoe, and um, so, but it'll be cool because of the speed of the, of the canoe moving along. It'll be a nice, cool, comfortable trip. Um, and there'll be some birding, but because it is the heat of the day, it won't be, um, can't expect that much. And we may come across a few rain showers on the way. Um, we'll be passing some river islands and the scenery is pretty monotonous in some ways, but it, there are some subtle changes. And if you're really watching carefully um, and examining the river, looking for birds or whatever, uh, you'll, you'll notice some differences. And eventually after around two to two and a half hours, depending on the speed of the river, the flow of the river, which depends tremendously on the climate, what's going on in the Andes, if it's raining or not, the river can go up and down tremendously um, and very, very quickly. Um, we will be, you know, coming into the Anyangu Quichua territory on the south bank of the Napo River. And eventually we'll just pull into a pretty inconspicuous spot, a muddy bank where we will unload, unload ourselves and our gear, um, and walk over to the, um, the village of Anyangu, where we were gonna spend uh, two nights um, in the Anyangu community. So we'll be seeing some of, some of the community's um, activities. Uh, the buildings that were uh, off to the right, there are, th there are about four roofs, we'll see another shot of that, um, is a school, a boarding school. There. So we'll be seeing children and, and families 
around. Uh, this is in, you know, right, right there is the, um, the cultural center. This is the dining area and our, sort of our center of operations. We'll basically most of our, our outings over the next two days will, will be from this point. And of course our meals will be here and, um, and actually burning from, from the dining area is, is pretty good. Um, the cabins are set back a short distance from, from the village and the dining hall, it's just a short walk. And it's a, a battery of, of, um, of cabins. They're comfortable, uh, 24 hour electricity and hot water. Um, they have basically everything you'd, you'd need, especially for the, the short time that we'll be there. Uh, they do not, uh, up until before the pandemic, they do not have uh, Wi-Fi, but uh, Napa Wildlife Center does. And we'll continue. This is um, many species, uh, you know, and, and, and can be seen from the area, from around the cabins, from the, um, the dining area itself. I'm not going to get into too many of those, um, but the, the possibilities are pretty great. Uh, these are just some of the species that we may see and, they'll, you know, tanagers and all sorts of stuff uh, are possible. And both day and night, um, these three mainly nocturnal species um, are basically hang out somewhere around the cabins and the, and the dining area or in the fields, um, you know, in the, in the edge around the fields. Um, and so we'll be looking for those probably there's a good chance we'll see them, the three of those bees. So after we settle in, you know, into the rooms, generally most of the afternoon outings begin at around 3, 3.30. If it's very hot, sometimes even a little bit later. And we're gonna take a sort of a stroll along the Anyango Community Trail, which runs um, along the Napa River. It's a very long trail. We will certainly not go uh, the length of it either way, either direction, but uh, the birding is excellent. Uh, there's some, a little bit of some primary edge forest and and um, secondary woodland and uh, a bunch of different habitats. And some of the birds, uh, forgive me tremendously, forgive me for this terrible photograph of this pretty cool scarce species, which is found in this area. And we'll certainly be looking for uh, this rufous headed woodpecker, one of the celius woodpeckers. Um, and the species diversity, understory species. Um, this white lord ant is basically found along along the river in some in some of the Varsia uh, woodland and forest um, along along this trail. Is we can often hear them, and hopefully we might get to see one. And some of the more exotic um, ant birds can be found in this area um, along the trail. So the afternoon is should be very inspiring and should be quite birdy and there'll be all sorts of stuff. I'm not going to go into all of them. The following morning, uh, so we'll, you know, get back to, um, um, we're going to take the river, um, uh, take to the river and visit um, two saladeros, one on the river and then also some river islands, maybe one or two river islands. Um, this one saladero, this uh, clay lake where the where parrots gather, um, usually has hundreds of parrots, and and, and um, generally of these four species that are here down on the lower left, um, this larger mealy amazon up here in this area, these are all mealy amazon. These smaller ones are the yellow crown amazon, um, blue headed parrot. These two over here and um, dusky headed parakeets and every once in a while other par other species show up but generally it's hundreds of birds um, here uh, a raptor was spotted and they all just went bananas and flew out and the noise is uh, deafening to say the least um, these river islands are just you know you know they're, they're very interesting um, and we'll do the best again, you know, weather has a lot to do with how long we can spend on them, uh, you know, and which ones we can visit. If it's raining, if it's, if it's, you know, just too hot by the time we get out there, generally we visit early. One of the species we'll certainly be um, aiming for is Amazonian umbrella bird, which uh, they display in one of the areas that they go to very early 
uh, one of the first places we'll visit, we'll, we'll be looking for that species. But they're possible in other places also. And on the river islands, um, there are a whole series of um, river island specialists that colonize these islands. Uh, and it's extremely interesting as, um, as long as these islands can survive the river currents and not get washed away, the older they get, the different uh, the species of plants that colonize them. And depending on the species of plants that are on these different islands will depend on the species of birds that we can find. And we'll be looking for a whole slew of spine tails and ant birds and flycatchers of, of all kinds. And so this is just a, a, a taste of, a little taste of what, what's possible. Um, and then we're gonna be heading after the river islands, and this is before lunch, <laughs> we're gonna be heading um, to a forest saladero, to a forest clay lake. And this one, this trail was um, a muddy mess when they first um, opened it up and tried to use it for tourism. And they put in river rocks, which became tremendously um, slippery when, when it was raining, which it does very often. Um, and so they decided to pave the whole thing. And so there's a half a mile paved walkway to get us to this point, which is, uh, and there's a, uh, a concrete structure built, roofed structure as a, as a blind, where we can overlook this, um, this area. And this is where these, um, uh, this is our main point of interest. On the way, there are a lot of different bird species possible. On many occasions, we've uh, come by this um, crested owl roost. And this is one species, which is rather cool to see it in the daytime. Um, and But there are many species possible. Mixed foraging flocks, ant birds, all sorts of things on the way uh, to and from the, um, the landing. And from there, um, that's what we're coming for. We're, we're, we're here waiting to see if the parrots have already arrived when we got there, which is great. And sometimes we have to wait and we can wait up to an hour, sometimes more for these parrots to come down um, to drink the waters here, these um, highly mineral pregnated waters. Um, and here are um, three species, cobalt wing, parakeets, the orange sheet parrot, and one scarlet, this one right over here, scarlet shouldered parrotlet. This is generally the least common of all of them. Um, and once they come down, and the reason they don't come down is they're always watching for predators, whether it be a snake or a raptor flying somewhere or just about anything. And so it takes them quite a while once they're able to slowly work their way down, the noise becomes deafening. Um, as they get there. And once one or two hit the ground, they all start coming down. And it's quite a show. Um, and so these are the main characters, but we also often and usually get these babies, the scarlet macaws, anywhere between a couple to six or seven show up. And they come down and it's, uh, you know, you feel like you're in a zoo or something. And this is this is the wilds. And they at this point, since the Anyango community uh, stopped hunting about 25, 30 years ago, they decided to go full on in tourism um, and stopped hunting. Birds, mammals are just becoming more and more oblivious to humans. So uh, these guys, you know, you do, we do have to be quiet and you can't move around too much, but they're basically pretty used to coming down. So this is one of the hopes. Um, and every once in a while, we get a, a, an unplanned visit. In this case, um, ornate hawk eagle came in and swooped down and grabbed one of the parrots, um, one of the orange cheek parrots. Um, and every once in a while, something else will come in. And we're always looking for that or hoping for that, for something, for some other, other species to show up. Um, and then, of course, some mammals show up from time to time, usually when the, before the parrots have arrived or um, you know, so this is a, a red brocket deer and some other smaller mammals will show up. Um, and some of the best uh, special guest stars that we can, that sometimes have shown up, um, Brazilian taper, this particular one stayed for about 45 minutes uh, and was definitely aware that we were there, but couldn't care less. 
Um, and now more and more there are sightings of jaguar. And they have also come in and, again, can be aware of our presence, but don't seem to worry too much. And so, you know, as long as we're sort of remain quiet and don't move too much, um, they're just, they're, they may come in. So we're always hoping for that. And then we get back to, um, we get back for lunch um, at Anyangu, at, at, at our dining area. And then after lunch, usually our afternoon outings begin around 3 o'clock, 3.30, sometimes 4, depending if it's extremely hot. Um, that those decisions when we when we depart in the afternoon uh, depend on you know we we just talk with the with the local guides and we decide on what's you know what's best for um, our activities. But we're going to go walk a very short distance to the first of four of the canopy towers that uh, the Napa Wildlife Center program has, um, and this white-throated toucan is just one of dozens and dozens of species that are possible and it's um it's really amazing to be up you know high in the canopy and it's just a whole nother world uh goes on there and not only birds i mean you know there are lizards and, and snakes and frogs there's just all kinds of stuff that that you can see in the canopy um the birding is is can be wonderful um and you're up, you know, you're just up there very often, just way above the way above the treetops. Um, and of course, anything can fly by. Um, here, merely Amazon and chestnut fronted macaws just came right, you know, whizzing right by us. Um, but the most exciting thing is just getting this eye to eye view of species that, you know, they're just always up in the canopy or often up in the canopy and you never get these kind of looks. So, you know, we just spend the afternoon just looking 360 degrees around the, um, the tower. Um, some of the parts of the trees are, you know, just are just right there at the tower. And so some of the birds are like right in our own tree, if you want to look at it that way. Um, and again, the numbers are tremendous um, of possibilities, especially. The following morning, we have lots of options. We can, if for some reason, the weather wasn't good, or there was the activity at the um, Saladeros didn't work out, or we didn't do so well on a river island. We can revisit, you know, any of those. Um, but the main goal would be to visit this second canopy tower, another very tall canopy tower. Um, you can see the treetops below, um, and again, the species are wonderful. Uh, the possibilities are just tremendous. This is lemon-throated barbet, uh, just one of many. Very often, mixed foraging flocks will come even into the trees right next to the tower, and you get a chance to see these things extremely close, but very often they're down below, and we're just looking everywhere. Everybody's, you know, just taking their part. We have our telescopes up there, um, and it's just quite incredible. Um, and in any of these Canopy towers, especially the ones that are, you know, in the forest, um, there's always the possibility of these large raptors. Obviously, we'll be looking for and hoping for harpy eagle, crested eagle, any of the hawk eagles of the three black and white, black or ornate hawk eagles sometimes show up. Um, this black face hawk can be seen. Again, we have, there are three of the four canopy towers are uh, in forest. Uh, one of them is at the lodge, at the Napa Wildlife Center Lodge, um, but we still have seen some pretty cool raptors from there. Um, so this, of course, will be something we can't guarantee, but we'll certainly be looking for. And then we head to the uh, Napa Wildlife Center landing. So, you know, this is this is um, early afternoon. Well, it'd be late morning, basically. Um, and this is the main landing. There are the... the um, paddle canoes there, we would come in with uh, our motor canoe and be come up to the landing here. Our suitcases will already have been uh, taken from um, the Anyango Cultural Center and taken to our rooms at Napa Wildlife Center. We will be having a barbecue here and the chance to do some birding as usual. Um, 
and then the magic begins. And I call it that is because uh, it's just so amazing the, the whole the whole trip into Napa Wildlife Center and Napa Wildlife Center itself. I, it's just blow. It's a mind blowing experience. So um, we begin uh, after our uh, barbecue and, and, and a little bit of downtime, um, birding and whatnot, just hanging out. Um, and we begin our paddle two and a half, two, about two hours generally can be much longer because we are really basically looking for birds and everything else on the way. Uh, this is one of our guides, one of the, the birding guides that uh, Napa Wildlife Center has. They're all excellent. Um, a few speak English, most only speak birders English which we call bird is English because they can, they know all the names of the birds in English and they can tell you where a bird's sitting in English, but um, try to get a conversation out of them is basically impossible. And um, this is just, you know, the views and the, the, if there was not a single animal or bird on this trip, just the scenery um, as we move down uh, stream, it's, it's spectacular. And so, We'll just take, be taking in all the sights and the sounds, everything, trying to see as much as we can. Um, and the possibilities, of course, almost endless. Um, some of the species we will certainly be hearing and looking for. And again, we will be on this particular stream, the Anyangu uh, Yaku and other blackwater streams um, throughout the trip. And so we have ch many chances for many of these species. Um, and these are just some. This tiny dot back ant bird is is a wonderful little guy, and we often get to see them along there, along the streams. Of the five uh, kingfishers that are found here, this is certainly one of the the ones we we want to see, but we'll probably see them all. Um, and other fauna, um, in this case a tree boa, but all sorts of snakes and things are possible, and other uh, species. Up in the, in the canopies and, and you know down in the in just along the shoreline, um, the species possibilities just keep keep multiplying, and we'll you never know. There's nothing planned, um, and so we do we do what we can. Here are several others. This absolutely stunning mass crimson tanager. Red cap cardinal, which is often seen right at the lodge, actually, um, and possible for something like a king vulture flying overhead. We can also see them from any of the towers, also on the lake. And we'll always be um, aiming for these babies, um, giant otters, which uh, were thought to be possibly extinct in Ecuador uh, from hunting and um, and until actually Napa Wildlife Center um, began, um, you know, doing all the work of building and, and exploring the area. And it turns out that there, you know, is a small population of them in this area. And because of the no hunting ban that the, um, the community put on them, themselves, um, the giant otters are often seen and they are pretty oblivious to humans. So it's pretty cool. They sometimes come by fishing. They're fishing all day long, and uh, they can come right near the canoes. And then we'll be looking for other specialties. This particular one, zigzag heron, is is one to find. Um, the uh, community is so keyed in on these guys; they find nests very often. And so, you know, if we're lucky, they, we might even see them on the way in this first um, this first afternoon. Uh, but otherwise, we we will be looking for zigzag herons. This is the smallest heron in the world. Um, on even some night trips, we may do some evening and night trips, not only for the heron, but for other species also. And then depending on water levels, the waters fluctuate tremendously in this area, and especially as I mentioned briefly, uh, depending on the rains in the Andes. And the water levels can go up many meters, several meters. Um, in a very short time. And if the water levels are very high, it's very difficult to see some of these um, 
more shoreline type species or ones that like the edge near, um, you know, where the water isn't that deep. And so if the water levels are low and depending on what height they are, um, we have a pretty good chance of seeing um, Enigami heron, which is just absolutely spectacular. Um, and then as we get closer and closer to our destination for that afternoon, um, we will be seeing uh, greater annies and huatzines, which are uh, these primitive, huge primitive turkey-like birds, clumsy as can be, and um, um, fairly common right around as we're getting to the lake and on the lake, and they can actually see, be seen sometimes from the lodge, at the lodge. And so we, um, as we come into Anyangu culture, we come make our, have our first views of Napa Wildlife Center. Um, this spectacular thing, hand, you know, designed um, but hand built by the um, the community, and um, designed by an architect that worked with the community, and we worked with them when we were putting this whole project together. Um, that tall pagoda is the main pavilion, if you want to call it that. That was constructed actually later. The community. Uh, being very successful in their business, decided that they wanted to um, upgrade their their dining area. And so that's a five story, I believe, um, building with an elevator. Think of that in the middle of the Amazon, a very slow moving elevator that takes you up to the, um, the observation tower. And so we will be here for five nights. Um, here's a view from the tower looking out onto uh, Anyangu Kocha, the lagoon, the Anyangu Lagoon, and out into the forest. Um, and the cabins are set around, uh, you know, just set around the, below the, the, the main pavilion, if you want to call it that. And uh, each cabin has a balcony with, um, with its hammock and some chairs um, facing the, the lake. Um, extremely comfortable. Uh, I would say posh more than we certainly need, but certainly welcome, especially after a long day of birding. Um, we're taken care of as if we were kings and queens and um, couldn't ask for more. Um, let's see. So we'll be birding, um, you know, basically our headquarters are the lodge and we'll be leaving uh, early mornings, we generally wake up at around 5 a.m., uh, 5.30 is breakfast, and then we head out um, in, into the field anywhere, along trails, along streams, uh, to any of the towers. Um, this is a species, this uh, beautiful capped heron can often be seen around, you know, the area of the lake, actually from the lodge often, um, and the possibility, again, are endless to all the types of activities that we're going to do. Um, and Napa Wildlife Center is not just birds, it's uh, everything else. And um, this is one of the richest areas in the world, actually, for monkeys. Um, between 10 and 12 species are found within the Yasumi National Park, which is where Napa Wildlife Center sits, right, you know, part of that park. At least 10 species of monkeys can be seen um, could be seen during our um, five days, five nights here. Uh, this is one of the common ones, white-fronted capuchin and squirrel, uh, common squirrel monkeys are often seen together in big troops often. Uh, certainly the squirrel monkeys can be, you know, 75 or more. And uh, again, they are pretty much oblivious to us. Um, you know, back in the days, in the early days of the project, um, most of the monkeys would just be gone. You would see the trees moving and they would be heading away as soon as there was any sense that humans were nearby. And now they just absolutely sit there and couldn't care less. And every once in a while we'll come and look, take a look at us. This uh, white-tailed um, tiki, it's got several names. It's been split from, um, um, from one base species into several. Um, they're often, th that photograph was taken right around near the lodge. Um, this species was recently split, called the Napo Saki, um, and that was one that was never possible 
to see. I mean, it just would bound away um, and you'd, uh, it took me years to actually see them. And now they just, as you can see, this one just sort of look at you and uh, from way up in the treetops and they just look at you like, uh, you know, okay, what kind of monkey are you? Um, White-bellied spider monkeys are often through there. And of course, uh, this Popig's woolly monkey. Woolly monkeys were one of the, so it's the large, one of the largest ones and they were hunted out very quickly. Um, again, were very difficult to see for many, many years. And um, now they are pretty much seeable. This we will be hearing lots of and seeing them also red howler monkeys often seen from the canopy towers. This uh, night monkey, the noisy night monkey, um, can be seen at their roosts in the daytime. Um, at night, sometimes, if we do go out at night, sometimes can be um, spotted in the trees. This is an endemic, the golden mantle tamarind. Um, a very, very special, adorable little monkey um, that we have a really good chance of seeing. And of course, this one, this is now called white-bellied, again, split, uh, white-bellied pygmy marmoset. Apparently, the, mar the pygmy marmosets from south bank of the Napo are completely different from the species that are on the north bank of the Napo. And these are found along, more along the river, more uh, closer to the uh, community, the Anyango community, than, uh, and probably not around Napo Wildlife Center. So uh, we may be able to see them um, at the first couple of days of our trip. And most of the trails traverse this terra firme. This is, um, you know, higher ground, well-drained forest, and they often, you know, dip and go into some swampy areas. And and the trails are, um, of course, the birding is a challenge in the in the um, rainforest, but the possibilities and rewards are huge. Just in mannequins, I mean, these are just three of the, the, the several mannequin species that can be seen. Um, in these forests. And the, it's a wonderful thing about the local guys, they sort of know where some of these territories are. And so at least we have a you know, good chance of seeing several of them. Um, this yellow-billed jacamar is a, is a understory um, jacamar. Um, White-fronted nunbird is often a leader of some of these mixed foraging flocks that, come, that work their way through the forest. And if we hear them calling, we'll certainly be going after them. Often we see them from the the canopy towers as mixed foraging flocks come through. And of course, a whole bunch of ant birds and other species um, are possible. And two of the largest species, we're gonna, we'll, you know, we'll be looking for everything. These are always possible, gray winged trumpeter and Salvin's curacao. Again, with this hunting ban has made it more possible to see these species. And once you do get, you know, get to see one, they are often not as skittish as they would have been some years ago. So, you know, we'll be definitely hoping to see some of these. And um, the Tiputini Trail is a, it's a long, a long trail, it goes on forever, uh, far more than we'll be able to walk it and that we would want to walk it. Um, and um, it just goes on and on. Um, through you know, past streams and over whatever, the habitat is great. Um, lots to see, obviously birds, but other species too. These are two um, poison dart frogs, um, but there are snakes, there are other mammals can be seen. Uh, we've seen white-lipped peccary, um, collared peccary, uh, everything, tracks of all kinds of animals, uh, taper are in here, uh, all sorts of things. Um, and this is one of the target species that we'll be going for, um, this black neck red cotinga. There's a, a lek, so that's basically the end point. We'll try to find this bird at its lek. There has actually several lek sites um, in this one area. And so we'll certainly be looking for this bird in the, um, in the sub canopy, very often hidden by leaves, a uh, very distinctive call, and that's what we'll be listening for. Um, this is again one of the one of the uh, birding guides carrying my telescope. He's very nice, nice enough to do that for me. Um, and this is the not this is the trail that goes back sort of heads back towards the Napo River and to a um, the Napo Canopy Tower, which um, 
is pretty spectacular. And the birding in the area um, will be looking for all sorts of all sorts of specialties. A long-tailed potu would be fantastic. They don't always see them, but the local guys often, uh, and the local uh, members of the community often, when they hear species like the long-tailed potu, they'll try to track it down, and it uh, makes it easier for you know people like us to find them. Um, mixed foraging flocks up in the canopy, um, and then of course ant birds. Um, this two hairy crested ant bird and white plumed ant bird. These are obligate army ant followers. And the word follower is kind of uh, misleading because when the army ants are swarming, these ant birds and others and many other species, including some of these wood creepers, are ahead, mainly ahead of the ants, picking off insects and other creatures that are running from the ants. Um, and the possibilities also are, are pretty great. Um, and interestingly enough, what they what they do here is, um, as we're out birding and doing whatever, they send up one of their um, helpers along, and he tries to locate ants. It doesn't always happen. And once they locate the ants, they predict where the ants are going to go, in what direction they're going. They set up a very quick, usually palm leaf blind, and then summon us the group around to the blind and we just wait. And um, if all goes well, the ant birds just start showing up as the ants are moving forward. Um, and we get to see, you know, I've gotten to see some excellent, just excellent calm looks at these ant birds, um, which you, you know, just very difficult to do on your own. And so uh, that's our hope. You know, if we, if we can find an ant swarm, that's fantastic. Um, and then their main canopy tower, this is the Napo um, canopy tower, Napo River canopy tower, was designed by NASA actually, and the community built it, put it together. Men, women, and children just worked and worked and worked and worked to get this. It's about 130 feet up to the tower, which you can see at the top there. Um, in, in, so the, the tower does not touch the tree, but the, the um, platform it sits on top. Um, Here's some looks at the tower, and this is the view out from the uh, platform. And again, birding is incredible. Uh, and we just spend the, you know a morning, maybe even possibly two. It depends on how well we do uh, and what other things we wish to see. Um, the possibilities at eye level, again, are tremendous. This is just staring, looking around. You know, looking down, looking above, we have the chance of seeing all sorts of things um, and species um, that we've seen, you know, hanging on. This is hanging on one of the guy wires from the tower, this uh, purplish jacamar. Green woodpecker, these bare-necked fruit curls very often just come in and land in the trees. That we're in the trees are so big, the canopy is so big that very often it's hard to spot the birds in our own tree, which is uh, pretty incredible. Um, Tanager mixed foraging flocks. If we get that, you know, we get we can get them very close. But very often we just see them perched uh, in the treetops somewhere, you know, on a tree nearby across the way. Um, several Arasari species are are in the area. This is just one, the ivory billed, and this wonderful canopy dwelling, mostly canopy dwelling, great jacamar is possible. We'll certainly be listening for them, maybe calling them. And so our version, our our ex experience ends at some point. It's always sad when it does. And we had, you know, we wind our way back to along the river, back to uh, Coca. Um, and our option, of course, is the flight back to Quito or continuing on to the eastern slope of the Andes, which is which takes us all the way up the Andes. Another week long trip visiting various altitudes, staying at three different lodges, um, all the way up to the high part of the Andes. So we'll be seeing everything from, you know, sort of the tropical species as we work our way up all the way to Andean condor, possibly up in the Andes. Um, so think about it. It's a pretty wonderful trip. The, the combination is, is unbeatable. And, um, 
some more information. So Brian and I will be uh, leaving this trip. Hope you can join us. That would be great. And um, I always like to take a little time to walk on water when I'm at um, at Napo. So um, I'll leave you with this uh, image. And thank you very much for joining us today and hope to see you in the field. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Ooh, thank you, Paul, for that wonderful presentation. Fascinating indeed. Uh, now I'd like to take this time to ask the audience for questions. And um, as those are coming in, we would like to uh, also bring in Victor Emmanuel. So let me turn to... I just wanted to add to what Paul said of this wonderful presentation. I've been fortunate to travel all over the world and I would put this spot one of the top 10 in the world. And I was fortunate to get to watch it built, watch it develop, the involvement of the community, it's extraordinary. And Paul has given a wonderful overview of it, which I encourage you to watch again, to really savor it and sign up for this trip. It is one of the top places in the world. Great, thanks, Victor. We have uh, a comment here from uh, Denise. She says, I have such great memories of that trip. Thank you. You're welcome. You gotta come back. It's worth two or three trips, I, I, I believe. <laughs> Me. The, the first one being uh, in, in January, right? 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter um, says, hey, Paul, you were involved in building um, the Napa Wildlife uh, Center Lodge. Can you tell some stories from that? <laughs> Do we have another hour or so? There, there are so many. Um, building the lodge and just and working with them, the, the, the challenges, uh, Peter knows well. Um, just getting this very small, sort of uncoordinated little community um, that were, you know, just eight members of the community were sort of into the idea because they'd worked in tourism to convince the rest of the community that this was something that they should do rather than, you know, hunt. And uh, the, basically life in that community was becoming basically, it was sort of almost ending. Uh, children from the community would uh, leave for school, leave leave the area and go to Coca and other places and never return. And so the community really was suffering and just needed a change. And they realized they had this, this wonderful area that, you know, at least some of them realized that. And to convince the rest was quite a job. Uh, Peter had a lot to do with that. Um, and, then, and then the building of it, bringing the, you know, all the equipment down from the Andes, driving it down on these roads and then bringing them in and then paddle canoeing refrigerators and huge mattresses in the rain, out of the rain. It just, it was totally nuts. How this thing came together um, is, is basically miraculous. And how the community really took to running this thing professionally in, in a way, um, I would say it works better than most businesses in the main cities in Ecuador. Um, they just know what they're doing and they, they, they're so serious about it and they see it as their future. Um, this is a very, you know, a community empowering project that, that is just so, I don't know, uh, it's part of, the, part of the allure of this whole trip is that you're sort of watching these people do their job, do, do what they need to do. And, uh, you know, they just don't hunt, uh, you know, they have these tremendous rules they impose on themselves which is incredible. I mean, stricter than anything I've, <laughs> I've ever heard. I wish some governments would do some of those things. And so, it, it, you know, we can go on if you want. We can have a, a long, 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 long talk about that in the future. And, I, you know, bring in Peter for that too. Yeah, there is a, a question uh, from Marty uh, wondering if Dr. Inglis is still involved somehow in the community. Uh, well, we're, we're not involved basically at one point, 2007, we turned everything over to the community, um, and we still have relationships with them. Of course, you know I've been going uh, on trips there, um, and we still have connections with them. Uh, actually, when I was thinking of doing this um, this presentation, I contacted them, um, telling them that you know I was going to do this, and if they had photographs and anything that they would like to share. Um, 
And so the you know it's, this is a this is a very long relationship. Many of the, the the especially the original eight people that were involved in the community, we know them. Oh boy, I, I, I probably know them for forty years, thirty five years, some of them. Um, so we you know way before the project was was started and even dreamt about. Um, so uh, so uh, and actually Peter and I were there uh, I think a year and a half ago, if I can remember correctly. We did a trip and we were just totally blown away. You know, everything every time we go, every year, every visit is it gets better. It's it's incredible. They just do more and more. They're you know the the, the animal life just gets. I don't know, more tame, more, more, I can't even call it the word tame. They just oblivious to us. Um, so more possibilities and the community just does more and more. They just get into more and more things. So it's, it's, it's fascinating and inspiring and, uh, you know, you've got to see it to believe it. Well, that sound, it sounds like it's a great time for Brian Gibbons to jump on board on this tour. That's what I'm hoping. That's what I'm hoping. You can get away from his neighbor. I've been to the Amazon along the Napo, but that was a long time ago. And to see uh, the big mammals, like you're describing, tame monkeys and those towers uh, for birding and mammals just seems really exciting. So I hope we uh, see you in a few months down there. Yep. Hoping, hoping. Fingers crossed. Uh, let me take just a minute to let our audience know about our upcoming webinars. Uh, we have two of them this time that we want to highlight. Uh, one is meet our newest vent tour leader, Willie Hutchison. We will host an interview with Willie and learn more about his background, birding passions, and upcoming vent tours. And that will be on August 19th. Uh, that's in two weeks. And then two weeks after that, we will have the Amazon River Cruise, a birding and natural history odyssey with David Escanio. The Amazon River, the most diverse watershed on earth, hosts the world's largest avifauna and myriad other life forms. The very word Amazon brings to mind flocks of parrots and macaws, toucans, raptors, wonderful cloud formations, golden sunsets, vast tributaries, pink river dolphins, primates, and fascinating culture. Our Amazon River Cruise is always among our most popular departures. From Iquitos, Peru, we will explore three major rivers and various tributaries aboard the beautiful and extremely comfortable Zafiro. Individual cabins face the river, and an upper deck offers a delightful wildlife observation experience. Excellent cuisine and service are provided by a riverboat crew that is among the best in the world. Please join us September 2nd when Vent Tour leader David Escania will share the extraordinary birds, wildlife, and culture of the incomparable Amazon River. Now, uh, we have a question here, Paul. Maybe you could um, answer since you are in Ecuador. Um, they're kind of uh, in Quito, um, Cheryl asked, what is the COVID situation um, and how many people are vaccinated there? And I wonder also vaccinated there, if, if you know how the community is handling this. Yeah, um, right now the, the um, vaccination program has, has uh, had a real jump start. And at this point, they're going by age, going down the you know, to younger and younger ages. So now they're, um, they'll be, I guess, vaccinating down to 12 years old. Um, and that would be, of course, with the Pfizer, but they have several vaccines here. Um, and they're getting, you know, they keep getting more. Um, I would say, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if the full, fully vaccinated might be up to 15%, but far more have their first vaccination and they're waiting for the second. Um, the you know the government has been fairly strict about you know controls, but you know they're obviously like everywhere in the world there are a lot of people who are afraid to get vaccinated or don't really want to get vaccinated. We don't have as much of the political um, you know back and forth about that, but but um, certainly I would say the internet has um, done a good job of of um, misinforming people, so there are a lot 
uh, people who, who just, you know, are, are not willing to get vaccinated, though more and more are. Um, um, I believe that for, um, and I'm totally convinced that for these, you know, these trips that we're doing out into the wild areas, all of the lodges all over Ecuador are very uh, conscientious about, um, you know, taking care of everybody, making sure that all the controls are, are on and, um, and there'll be more and more people vaccinated. So, you know, hotels are vaccinating all of their workers or as many as they can, especially by age. Um, by the time, you know, we're really doing our stuff, vaccinations should be pretty widespread in that way. And of course, when we're out in the wilds, most of the areas we go to do not have that many people. Um, you know, it, it's much easier to take care of ourselves. We, uh, one of the reasons we're staying in the hotel that I mentioned at the beginning uh, outside of Quito is um, that it is away from the city. So we don't, you know, there, there will be very few people around and that's basically what we're, what we're aiming for. Um, but again, um, I think, you know, they're trying, they're trying their best, the government and the country itself, especially the businesses are trying, you know, the, as hard as they can to do what they need to do to keep this thing under control. And it, it's like everywhere else, it's going to go up and down for a while. And we're just hoping that by the time, you know, most of these tours, uh, start up in Ecuador more steadily, um, that everything will be pretty well handled. Um, so, you know, that's where we are right now. For our August trip, I think we're going to be fine. I have no doubts that, you know, anywhere we're going to be staying will be, you know, the, the hotels are small. We're going to be in the country. We'll be, you know, out in the field. So I think that'll be fine. Wonderful. Uh, we have time. I'll take one more question, uh, but I will also have a few comments here from the audience. Jim says, great presentation. And Thank you. And Barbara mentions that she went with Paul many years ago, uh, which was great and great memories. And she's so happy that she got to relive the experience through your virtual birding presentation. Thank you. Got to come uh, back. Cut, exactly. It's not a one and done. That's right. Now, Ecuador oof, is a tiny country with so much to see. I mean, if you th think of it just as, a, a, the, you know, the two countries that are battling out to see who has more species um, in the world, you know, the, to be the number one bird species uh, are Brazil and Colombia. Colombia and Brazil, 1900 something species. Ecuador, which is a, a less than a fourth the size of Colombia, has 1700 something species. And so, you know, you're thinking of Ecuador as this tiny little country, compact, like, you know, like sardine can filled with filled with birds, not so much sardines. Um, and <laughs> there's just so much to see. And we're finding more there and the more new species for the country. We found a, uh, just had a new hummingbird species to science. Um, and so it's um, it's worth a lot of visits. I've been living here for you know 48 years, almost 49, and I'm um, I'm not tired of it. Wonderful. Uh, for our final question uh, for this presentation is for um, for both of you. Uh, do you all have a, a target bird for this tour? I'll let, I'll let Brian shoot for it first. I, I've seen black-necked red Katinga 20 years ago, but I would love to see one again. Uh, they're a pretty spectacular thing in the forest there, but with a few hundred to choose from, it's like the whichever one's in front of me is my favorite bird. That's the, that's the way I, I think of things. Yeah, um, there's one species that I have not seen there, um, a wing-banded ant bird. It's rare in Ecuador, and there are a couple of sites for it, and the, the guys always promise me that bird, and they failed me so far. And I sort of smile at them because I've gotten them many, many birds and everything over time. So they I, I, they sort of feel like there's some responsibility to get me that bird, but they keep failing on me. So that would be one, that would be it. Otherwise, everything I look at, and that's everywhere in the world, any bird that's in front of me is my favorite bird. I don't care what, how common, how rare, whatever. So yeah, and there's so much to see as, as Brian just said, um, there's just no time to even think of that stuff. There's just too much stuff going on, so. Uh, and these towers are just so wonderful. It's just this, the most leisure birding. You just sort of go around, you know, circle, looking around 360 degrees, and you spot something here and spot something there and spot something there. And it's just all morning filled with activity. Um, 
it's just I don't know. It's undescribable. You have to you have to live it to 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 come back and go. Oh my God, you know what happened? Just what happened? And then of course these floating down these streams. Um, if you see nothing, it's wonderful, and everything you see makes it just wonderful. Plus one, two, three, four, ten, twenty, thirty, whatever. So it's a great stuff. Great stuff. Wonderful. Well, well, wonderful. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for uh, uh, joining us today. Wonderful presentation. And uh, thank the audience for joining us for another event webinar. And we hope to see you again in the future. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Well, that was awesome.